Hey, everybody, welcome. It is Thursday, August 29th. I'm Jenny Guy, the marketing manager for Mediavine. And it is hard to believe that another summer is almost gone. It is Labor Day weekend, which means that our second annual Summer of Live is wrapping up. Crazy, crazy, crazy. So just to remember where we've been in June, we talked about all things Mediavine. We talked about Create, uh, which is our most valuable WordPress plugin, a couple other things that are coming up. In July, we went beyond the blog, talking book publishing, and content creation, and philanthropy. And then all through this month, we've been talking about making it rain. We, we're basically a broken record when it comes to diversifying your revenue stream. So we've talked video, affiliate marketing, SEO, RPM, and we are closing out this summer of live extravaganza with the metric that impacts all of the above metrics, traffic. There is, we were, as I was talking with my great guests before we started, we all have a love-hate relationship with traffic, but I don't think any of us would deny that more of it is better. Traffic on Like Store from Instagram swipe up feature to more lucrative campaigns with brands. Plus, for those that are out there wanting to join Mediavine, we have the traffic threshold of 25,000 sessions in the previous 30 days to work with us for full service ad management. So, if we've got anyone out there that's looking to reach the traffic threshold, post in a comment and say hi. But I'm going to go to my two amazing guests. They know traffic. They know how to grow traffic and real traffic, not bot traffic. And they're here to tell all their secrets, or at least some of their secrets, to their to our wonderful audience today. First, I've got Jennifer Mishkin. She is one of the OGs of Pinterest, where she has over 3.5 million followers. She shares all things food, entertainment, fashion, and family on her website, Princess Pinky Girl which by the way is celebrating its six year blog birthday today. Happy birthday to Princess. Thank Pinky you, Girl. thank you, Judy. She came to be a full-time blogger after 20 years in the corporate not-profit industry and now she blogs full-time and she has blogging expertise is one eighth of bloggers tell all, which is the advanced mastermind group for educational resource for other influencers who aspire to financial freedom and blogging success. She lives in Michigan with her husband and three boys. Hello, Jen. Thank hey, Jenny. Me. Thanks for having me. So great to have you today. And my other guest, Tanya Harris Fleming, is a mom, wife, attorney, recipe groupie, photographer, and traffic whisperer who took a love of pressure cooker and air fryer recipes and turned them into a full-time income on her part-time blog, My Forking Life, which she began only in 2016. So for devoting between five to 15 hours a week to her site, she reached up to 500,000 page views a month. She reached the media mind threshold in April 2018 and was able to quit her job as an attorney earlier this year to blog full time and spend more time with her two daughters. Thank you for joining us, Tanya. Hi, Jenny. I'm glad to be here. All right. So if you have questions, you guys know the drill, but if you have questions, they're saying the sound quality is low. What's going on? Uh oh, Jen, can you put on headphones? I think they're saying that it's echoing. I sure can. Thank you. Fantastic. Alrighty, guys, we're gonna work on it. Sorry, everyone, we'll work on it. My apologies. Okay, hang on a second. Let's see if that helps. Give us one moment. Let's see, is that better, everybody? Maybe? All right, let's give it a shot. I'm gonna go on with questions, but as I always say, if you guys have questions, please post them in the comments and I will ask my guests, Tanya and Jen. But let's start out first just with a basic question. Let's talk about your journeys, your sites, your brand, and how you initially started out with the traffic growth. And I will start with Tanya. All right, so um, I started my blog March 2016 when I was working full-time as an attorney and I, just had a general food blog. Um, I didn't want to niche down, so it was all types of food, whatever we were eating. I guess I had a general quick, easy, family-friendly recipes, and I was also doing restaurant reviews. Um, but over the time, I would post like once a week, and I had no direction, and my passion started to wane. So I took a break um, about June 2017. And I came back to the blog in February of 2018 with just the main goal of actually growing my site to enough sessions to grow to, to be able to qualify for Mediavine. So I had did my research, looked at my Google Analytics, realized people loved pressure cookers and air fryers. So I kind of just went that route um, and just used that to grow my site. 
and I was able to qualify for many of mine in April of 2018. Yay. And so I love to hear that you were you were kind of blogging just as a hobby and you were doing what you want, following your passions and wherever your wherever those led you. And then you got really intentional with it. And that's when you started. So you was it accurate to say that's when you started to see the growth and the and the impact in your in your analytics? Yeah. And that was that was my whole intention. Like at that time, I think I had like two pressure cooker recipes. And I kept on getting comments when I was on my blog break and I'm, and they were always towards those recipes. So it was like, oh, this is what people wanted from me. Um, and so at that time I decided to make a content strategy, which making that the majority of the content that I shared, I still shared other recipes, but I knew that those were gonna be my money makers. So I really just focused on those. Um, and then the other recipes I would still post just to show my audience that I could do more than just pressure cookers and air fryers but I knew that that was gonna be the ones that brought me the most traffic. Awesome. Oh, sex in the city. Heck yeah. Hey, there's no there's no shame in that game. All right, Jen, same question to you. Talk to us a little bit. I don't know if you heard, but I wanna hear a little bit about your brand, how Princess Pinky Girl came about. And um, Tanya, Ta Ta I don't know I don't know if I said this, or My Forking Life, it's a great site. Um, and we're gonna share that link too. But uh, Jen, will you share a little bit about how you initially started Princess Pinky Girl and, and your journey with it? Yep. Can you hear me okay with my earphones? We can hear you great. And we are also not hearing um, 75 echoes, which is a plus. Great. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I, as you've heard, it's my blog anniversary today. So um, it, it was actually two years before this, before my blog anniversary. So about eight years ago, I was planning my son's bar mitzvah and I was doing so using Pinterest. And um, uh, my Pinterest board blew up. It was like, like you said, kind of like in the, in the good old days of Pinterest when um, I was highlighted as a, as a, um, I guess as a, a, a feature board and all of a sudden I had a million followers on there. So I got really lucky. I'm very different. I have a very different story than most people because my social came first and my blog came second. So I was monetizing my Pinterest, um, through affiliate marketing and then decided that I needed to diversify it and, um, started the blog and I didn't know what it was in a blog about. I didn't know what a blog was. Um, but I just decided, you know, one afternoon in my backyard to start one. And I'm not going to go into the name because that's a whole other story. But basically, <laughs> it's, it's my girl. I have three boys. It's my girl. So let's leave it there. And then um, I really relied um, 100% on social traffic and really had no idea how to blog until a couple years ago when I started learning that, you know, social traffic is great, but you're relying on someone else. So it was time to start relying on myself and um, focusing on SEO and other, you know, of ways to get traffic, you know, outside of Pinterest, which was good because Pinterest, um, you know, again, it can be like a bad ex-boyfriend. Um, and so can. <laughs> so so can. You cannot stop texting it, them. You have like, a couple of glasses right. of wine. You definitely are dialing and all that. So, yeah, it's it, you know, it's not, it's, it's not the good old days of Pinterest. So you have to, you know, really to kind of take it more in your own hands. Um, and within that time is when we, you know, I started with bloggers tell all as well, which we talked about, you know, for a minute, but we'll talk about more hopefully later. Yes, we definitely will revisit that. So let me go ahead and just jump in and talk a little bit more about your journey with Mediavine. How long have you been with us and how has Mediavine impacted your business? Um, um, Jen, let's start with you. This time. Okay. I think I've been with Mediavine for three years. -ish. We just celebrated our third year of shifting to full service ad management. So that is possible. Maybe it was two years. It was either two or three. It wasn't right when you guys shifted. Okay. Um, but yeah, so I've been with Mediavine for probably, it's probably at least two years. Um, and what was the second part of the question? And how has Mediavine impacted your business? And really the, the nitty gritty of that question, of the question that I want to get into is mm -hmm. how has ads, have they impacted your traffic? I mean, 100%. And my RPM has, you know, first of all, my RPM has been better than ever. Um, my traffic, you know, I... I've made a shift from traffic again from social to, you know, to trying to get my, you know, my own um, organic and direct traffic. Um, so there's been, you know, definitely some ups and downs there, but even when there were downs in traffic, because my RPM continues to go up, my income has been, um, you know, steadily increasing throughout my journey. So that's been really great. Um, and for me, the community at Mediavine is like, is, 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 is so important to me. 
Um, you know, they, I was having a lot of issues with my site speed. I was having a lot of issues with um, other funky stuff going on with my, with my blog because of the way that it, it was built. And I think that, you know, because I didn't know what I was doing. And, you know, Mediavine not only, um, not only like was concerned about my ads, they were concerned about the whole health of my site. And that was what kind of drew, drew me to them and, and, and has like continued my love fest with them. Or you. Mm-hmm. Love us. Uh, sweet love. I mean, I'll take it. I'll get it. <laughs> Tanya, what about, uh, obviously there are so many people beyond me that go into making Mediavine what it is clearly, but I will be the personification of Mediavine and take the love at this time. Uh, Tanya, what's going on? We talk, talk to me. Same question to you. Um, so I joined Mediavine April of 2018. Um, and since then, every single month, my traffic was growing as well as the... So to kind of give you a, a standpoint of where my ads were beforehand, I was with a different ad agency and I had one very small ad in the sidebar, mm-hmm. basically because I was terrified to put ads on my site because I thought they would slow them down. So yeah. I had heard so many great things about Mediavine, not just on a monetary side, but also that it wouldn't slow down your site. So that was my goal. Once I joined, that's when my site had a ton of ads. And my first reaction was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. And I immediately initially wanted to turn them down, but I was like, you know what, let me see what the response is. And honestly, I've never had a complaint about my ads at all because my side is still fast. Well, I will say media impact on my traffic because my traffic still grew. My site is fast. Um, my users are happy as well as monetarily wise, even if my traffic fluctuated, we all know we have traffic spikes and there's slumps throughout the year. My RPM continued to grow because I just followed the best practices. I'm also heavy into video. I think last year was the year of the video and I was here for it. So um, that helped a lot with my RPMs and my earnings as well. And so just like Jennifer stated, I love the community because probably about 95% of the things I know about site speed or SEO or even Pinterest, I learned by watching lives or just being in the Mediavine group. So again, I love you all. I love you, Jenny, too. So here's a hug or heart to you, too. But um, I've learned a ton since I've joined Mediavine, just following the best practices that you guys preach. Um, just checking in on Jen's dogs. There, there, sometimes there's going to be a mute. Uh, we love you too, and hearing about both of your journeys is super inspiring. I, I mean, I don't think that anyone is going to say that they that people are coming to their site for the ads. So I don't know that anyone's going to go, yeah, ads. we <laughs> love ads. Uh, but to hear that it's not impacting you negatively and you're not getting negative feedback, and that your speed is still good, and all the things that you're that your viewers can still come for the amazing content that you're providing, but not getting adversely impacted through the ads, I think is the goal that we're shooting for at least. Um, We have not yet found a way to make ads the most awesome thing on your site, but we don't want to. The whole point is for you guys to be compensated for the incredible work that you're doing. Uh, What, and yet the the year of video has become the decade of video. Um, I think that video is is still incredibly lucrative, but in addition to that, it is driving the traffic. Do you find, and I'll ask that, that's actually not on my, my questions list, but do you find, are both of you leaning into the video and are you finding that video is positively impacting your traffic? I'll start with you, Tani, since you brought up video in the first place. Absolutely. Um, I think I think it's still the case, um, but like the social media platforms like Facebook, whenever I would share a video, it would have much further reach than um, other like links or even photos. Pinterest now, if you look, um, sometimes if you're searching a topic, you'll see the videos at the top. So that's helpful there, as well as even in Google, if you're searching for recipes, you'll see they have a little play button. So it's helped with click through to my site on social media platforms, as well as in Google. So I definitely think, I don't think I would have the same amount of traffic I have if I wasn't incorporating video into my content strategy. Love hearing that. And same question to you, Jen, how is video in in your world? Um, I guess like video for me is not as big of a happy fest right now as it was because I was here two and three years ago when, when video really did like, it was, it was a viral sensation. And like, I would put it like, that's, that's where I got my first virals and I was getting you know, 10 million views on a video um, and seeing the traffic to follow it. Um, so that, I mean, that was really when video was, was 
really first came out, especially in Facebook. Um, the Facebook videos for me have not really um, been, the ROI on them has not been as good for me. Now, I'm not doing the long form videos or, you know, I'm doing more of, I'm still doing the hands and pans and those are just not, again, the ROI isn't there as much, but I continue to do it for, um, you know, kind of specific reasons, you know, obviously for Google. Um, and the, you know, for Pinterest, I, I'm on the fence on, on video for Pinterest right now because I'm oh, yeah? seeing the impressions and I'm seeing, you know, the saves, but I am not seeing traffic from it. Okay. Um, you know, so for me, you know, it's, it's, I'll continue doing it. It's not going anywhere. Um, but I'm not seeing the benefit that I was seeing from video. Okay. Fair enough to say that in terms of a traffic standpoint, but just to clarify, revenue is still good from video, right? In terms revenue of revenue is still good. Yes, revenue is right. still good from video, and the video player for Media Buying has been very profitable for me. Good, fantastic. Okay, I want to talk a little bit nuts and bolts traffic wise. So I'm um, not traffic wise, traffic content wise, and how that impacted traffic. And Tony, you kind of already touched on this in that when you began intentionally changing your traffic, uh, changing your content strategy up and creating a content strategy to begin with is when you started to see those traffic growth. So I want to talk about that a little bit more specifically with you. And then with Jen, I want to talk about specifically what you did with your content to switch from that social model into an organic traffic model. So let's start with Tanya and then go to um, go to Jen. So when I started, I, I mean, like I said, I studied my Google Analytics and I saw the, luckily, you know, I'm a gadget junkie. So I had a pressure cooker, I liked it. and saw that that was also a trending topic. I also use Google Trends, not quite as often, but just to look to see, okay, what are what is getting higher searches in Google and what's trending at the time? And luckily for me, it's stuff that I actually, it's already food related, so I can actually do that. Um, I also am in like a ton of Facebook groups with, you know, with my people, with my gadget people, because that also shows me what people are excited about, what type of recipes people are creating, what kind of questions they're having. And I use all that to, you know, also help me with the content strategy in, in addition to my keyword research. So once I started to do that, I only, cause I only posted once a week cause that's, I was still working full time. I would use all that information to make sure whatever post that I posted, I knew that I had a higher probability of ranking in Google, a higher probability that people in these niche groups would get more excited and I'd get more engagement um, on my content as well. So it's really, basically was really driven by my prior post, but also by what was trending in the community as well. And what, just to stay on top of all of those things, what is your, how do you keep track of everything that people are talking about? Do you immediate, would you immediately go out and create whatever it was that people were talking about? Did you have like a, a little diary? What, how long did you have? What was the shelf life of that hot thing? Did you find? It would usually like maybe within that month, maybe. Cause I, I don't really, I suck at creating content calendars. They're not that far out. But if I'm like in a Facebook group and everyone's asking these questions, I will go and then I will test it. And then if it was, if I had great results, I'd be able to write a blog post, do my, you know, I do step-by-step -step photos and share that content. So um, I'm all, I mean, I'm always in these groups because I'm passionate about it. I have lots of gadgets. So whenever I would get it, I would, you know, usually run to figure out if it's a good topic or not. I also use Airtable to keep a long, long, long list of different topic ideas. Um, and it helps me stay organized on top of different content that I'm creating. We like Airtable too. We actually had a live about Airtable. So we, I think, can post that in there. We love Airtable. Okay, Jen, same question to you. Talk about that intentional content shift going from the social traffic to organic traffic. Sure. Um, so like when I started, I did a lot of roundups. It was all about roundups, but didn't have a lot of content to, to them and took people away from my site. Um, in the last, you know, I'd say three years or so, I've really shifted to do more food blogging and travel. So those those have been my, my you know, two real um, focus areas, especially with the food. And with the food, um, I really have worked on rather than what I used to do, which was write a little blurb, post recipe, done. Now I'm, you know, really doing a lot more keyword research, um, you know, seeing what, you know, what's out there and what I need to be focusing on, what questions to answer, um, making sure my content is long. 
um, you know, especially for 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 ads and Google actually, you know, Google likes that. Worked on my yeah. you know, my H twos and all that. Um, so that's you know, I spent a, a lot of time with that and also researching what type of recipes are you know, you know, are are not just going to get social traffic, but they're going to get organic traffic as well. And which ones I feel like I can actually have a chance to rank for. So. Um, that, you know, that's been, that's been a big focus. You both talked about keyword strategy and I think that that's something everyone agrees is important, but I would like to hear more, uh, nuts and bolts of how you do keyword research. Where are you doing it? Are there specific, um, are there specific sites you like to use specific programs? Talk to me a little bit. Give us a general overview of your keyword strategy. Jen, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, Samrush is, and I never I don't know if it's Samrush or SEMrush, but whichever one it is, I use it. We know what um, you're talking about. <laughs> so, you know, that's my first go-to, and I love, love, love the plugin that they have um, in WordPress where you can use the float mode for it, and it has it right alongside while you're writing, which has been, like, like mind-blowing changing for me, life-changing yeah. for me. That's really nice because it's all right there for you. So if you're not using that, it's a great tool. Um, how much, and then I, Jen, how much is it? Cause we, we have no, a lot. It's free. If, it's free. If you have some rush, you can just, it's a plugin. Um, and it's a lightweight plugin, so it doesn't hurt anything. Um, it's really great. If you're not using it, I would absolutely look into using it. Um, keywords everywhere. I really like, um, I just use it when I'm using, you know, through Google and that gives you kind of a sidebar of, you know, what else is going on, what other kind of keywords there are. I really like that too. I use Google a lot just for you know, for keyword research, because I want to use it like the intention that a user would have and see what's pulling up for them. And then Pinterest, I do a lot of keyword research just in Pinterest too, to see what people are searching because Pinterest is a visual search engine. Um, you know, it's not as people, you know, they really have made a shift from being a social media platform to a visual search engine. And, you know, you need to see what people are searching when they're going there because they're not going in their feeds anymore and just scrolling. They're going there with intention. They're going there to look for something specific so I want to know how they're looking for that and we're, what, what's coming up in the top results because that will help me decide what I'm calling a recipe or what kind of keywords I'm putting in there. Fantastic. Love it. We're going to talk more about Pinterest in a second. But Tanya, will you jump in and talk a little bit about your keyword strategy? Yeah, it's pretty similar to say Jennifer's except I use Ahrefs. Um, rather than SEMrush and Ahrefs, the plan that I pay for, I think it's like 180. I pay for the the more expensive one, but initially I, I didn't. Before I grew my blog to the what point where I could afford it, I was using keywords everywhere, um, and I also use I think it's called KeySearch.co. Um, that's also a cheaper option, but I use those. Um, and one of my favorites, even though Ahrefs, I like it because it's super, super powerful, but I really like key search because it does give me a little green light, like red light or whatever. Um, and whenever I type in a term, it'll kind of give me a, yeah, you definitely want to go for this. And then there'll also be ones that are medium that I'm like, okay, I guess I can try and hopefully hope for the best, whatever. Um, I also do do regular Google searches. Um, and I use answer the public as well to know what people, it's great. I love the little guy. Me too. He makes me so happy. <laughs> he does. But I also use that definitely so I can make sure I'm answering um, users queries for whatever post that I'm posting about. And like Jennifer said, I also use Pinterest. I've always, I've never been a big feed person anyways when it came to Pinterest. I've always used it as a search engine. So I always do that when I'm doing um, my initial keyword research that helps me to do it from the beginning so I can see like what kind of images are popping up. So I have a better idea of what my images should look like or what other images may be missing that I might want to incorporate into my pins to get people to hopefully click on it. I love that. Start So it's just even from your inception period before you're even writing the post, because I think a lot of times people's strategy with Pinterest is creating those pins at the end. And now you're saying creating. So both of you do that. Talk a little bit more about that. Jen, are you similar in that way? A hundred percent. I mean, it's the same with, you know, with Google search, you know, you want to see what Google sees as the intention of that particular recipe. If it's going to be, you know, that you're on target with what they're showing. And a lot of times it's, you know, is, is it a plated version or is it something that's in a casserole dish that you should be showing? Because what is, what is, you know, Google actually showing you um, when you search for that? And if you, you know, have any hope to, to um, rank for it, you need to be, uh, you know, right on, on their, on, you know, in their mindset so that you can, 
get, you know, get with it. But then the same thing with, again, with Pinterest, because if you're talking about, you know, a, a you know, a recipe, um, and I, I can't think of an example right now, but I think actually um, someone that one that someone else, you know, has told me, like when we were talking about intention was like a uh, chicken chili recipe, is it white or is it red? And you need to know what they're, what they're looking for, because if you're doing a red one and every other one is white, it's not going to show up in those results. Could you talk a little bit about the same thing through the travel lens since you do that as well? Um, we're, we're doing a lot of recipes and I love recipes and I could talk about food all day long, but let's, let's, let's give a little shout out to some of our non foodies out there, Jen. I mean, just in terms of like for searches and stuff. Like yeah. If you, so when you go into yeah. look, in, look at Google and you're looking to see how things are being plated or uh, what type, you said white or red, yeah. what type of searches are you looking for with travel? I mean, it's like if for me when I'm doing my, my research for travel, it's less about the photos and more about the questions people are asking okay. that I'm trying to put in there as H2s. So for instance, I'm writing a post right now in Italy um, and you know, I'm trying to think about the questions that we had when we were going and, you know, how do you get from Positano to, you know, Sorrento or um, where can I store my luggage at the airport? You know, things like that. So I'm looking, I, again, I'm trying to put myself into the, you know, the, the shoes of the, of the traveler because it is, it's a very, it's a different mindset than recipes, a hundred percent. And my travel posts actually do really well in rankings, um, you know, Alaska cruise packing list. Um, you know, are they asking for an Alaskan cruise? Are they looking for Alaska cruise? Um, cruise line, you know, like what kind of searches are coming up? And I'm trying to go after those or put them in, in different ways so that it's hitting the search engines in those ways. Does that makes sense? Very helpful. Yeah, it absolutely does. Uh, so let's shift a little. Tanya, tell me what is your breakdown of organic versus social in your traffic, your overall traffic? And same question to you, Jen. Um, for organic travel, I had to look this up, but I'm um, about 50% 50 <laughs> traffic from Google and about 40% traffic from Pinterest and actually only about 4% from Facebook, which surprised me. Um, so wow. yeah, I, I think initially when I did start, I had more um, percentage of Facebook traffic, traffic, but as my site grew and I focused on um, SEO and like I said, my SEO strategy goes the same to Pinterest. Um, that's when those Google and Pinterest numbers just pretty much took over um, the amount of traffic that I bring into my site. Excellent. Same question to you, Jen. And I, I had to go look this up as well. And I just looked for like the last six months. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm a, probably a high 60% on social between Facebook and Pinterest. And interestingly, because I've had a, some really good runs in Facebook lately, my Facebook is outperforming my Pinterest right now. Um, so, and I'm about, I'd say 20, 25%, you know, um, you know, organic search traffic. So have you just to narrow in here since Facebook is a, is a, um, somewhat of a, I don't even know how to put it. Uh, it, it can be a little bit sketchy and a little bit out there and you never really know what's going to work. So what, ha what changes have you implemented? Have you done anything in particular to get those numbers better on Facebook? Um, the last, I mean, the last couple months, and I think that's about to change, so I wouldn't go run out and try this, but link posts have killed it for me. Okay. Um, but now we're starting to see dings from Facebook on link posts, which I don't know why. Um, so again, I wouldn't go run out and do it. It just happened over the last few, few days, so now I have to go and rethink my strategy there. But, it, you know, you got here's the thing with social is you got to write out what's happening at the time, and then come up with the next day. You know, you don't know how long it's going to go. So just enjoy it when it's going and then, um, pivot, you know, pivot. Constantly I'm pivoting right now. Awesome. Right. But it was a good summer. So, well, that's really exciting. You know, we're always looking for that. So, um, I'm going to ask about social in general. Um, but, uh, Karen Lee said, hi, Tanya Harris, Fleming Esquire. And hi, Karen. Courtney mm -hmm. Odell said, I love all of Jen's cruise posts. She puts in so much great info. Yay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Love for you guys. So talk about social in general as a traffic generator and where do you go to test all these things out? You're saying you're writing things out. Are you discover are you making these little discoveries on your own or are these Facebook groups? Where are you finding this information on what's working and um, how do you then capitalize on it and change your strategy? We'll start with Tanya on that one. You mean as far as like getting traffic to my site? 
Yeah, how when you're doing social experiments, how which which you said Pinterest is your number one performer in terms of traffic generation. What is your Pinterest strategy? You said it's similar to Google. Mm -hmm. okay. And for, for Facebook, what I did um, because I do so many niche like recipes, I'm in the niche groups um, for two reasons. One is for research, so I want to know what the people are talking about and what they get excited about, and then I will drop my recipes in there. I haven't been doing that as much as I used to, mostly just because I haven't focused on it. But when I was doing it a lot, I did see a lot of uptick in traffic when I did it on the weekends um, and when I dropped uh, really engaging videos. And the more engagement that I um, that I got, like if somebody commented, I made sure I responded to comments because that helps with traffic to my site. The only issue that I have with Facebook traffic when it comes to sharing it to groups is that that, that traffic lasts for about a day or two and then it just disappears. Um, I think back in the day, initially it would last a lot longer, but now it's not as strong as it used to be. Yeah. But I still don't give up on Facebook because we never know when you'll just get that. Like I had a, I had my highest earning day was a day where I dropped a holiday recipe. I think it was St. Patrick's Day, dropped it in each Facebook group and it went, it went crazy. And then after that, like my videos didn't do as well. So I think there's there in my strategy is just basically to make sure that every weekend, I put something in the group and I also engage with the community as well, particularly because partially because I actually like um, gadget recipes and I like, you know, commenting on them, but also just to kind of get, you know, just to be involved. So. So you are a big proponent of covering your bases, even if it's not necessarily working right now, you're not giving up on it. You're continuing to invest time in those different places and then just waiting for the moment when it goes great and you strike and that's good to know. Good to know. I think it can be easy to really feel like you're screaming into the void, especially on Facebook. Sometimes you're just talking and nothing, the, the reach is strangled or you had great one day and then the next day it's terrible. So it's encouraging to hear that you're still devoting time to those things. And, and, and I will say that I'm not devoting hours into my Facebook. Like sure. it's literally like 10 minutes. Like, so I, I would put more of my energy into making sure my Pinterest and my Google is doing really well, but Facebook, I think it's still, it's still worth it to show up. I wouldn't just say I hate Facebook. I'm never posting there. I definitely think it's important to just make sure you cover all your bases. Jen, same question to you. Talk about your social strategy yeah. and what you're finding most effective these days. Sure. Um, I mean, I do spend a lot of time in Facebook. I spend a lot of time in Pinterest, um, and I spend a lot of time just you know on a post. Um, for every post I do, I do multiple images for for Pinterest. Um, sorry, I'm getting like this weird sun on me. Um, I, um, you know, and um, I, I, you know, Facebook is the short game. For me, Pinterest is a long game. You okay. don't know when a pin is going to hit. You know, it might be a pin takes off right away, but more um, frequently now, it takes a little while for it to take off. So I'm like, I'm doing my Christmas stuff right now and I'm redoing pins. I'm constantly redoing pins. I'm constantly trying new formats. I'm trying, trying new formats. I'm trying new um, to pin dimensions. I'm trying different fonts. When I see a pin that's taking off, I'm going to go and make, you know, five new pins for it. Um, so, uh, you know, if I see one that's kind of fallen off, like an old post that had gone viral, I'm taking new images. I'm taking, or I'm taking old images and I'm reformatting them to do whatever's working in that current you know, currently, because what's working today isn't going to necessarily work tomorrow and what worked yesterday isn't going to work today. So I do spend a lot of time on my Pinterest images and on my descriptions and on, you know, distributing the information, you know, to groups, to tribes, to, um, you know, multiple boards and, and, and whatever, you know, all that. So I spend a lot of time on social, but it, it you know, it brings me a lot back. So for me, you know, it is a big part of my, my, you know, my traffic. I would love to, you know, I, what I would really love is to have that social traffic and to really boost, you know, at the same time I'm trying to boost up my, you know, my direct traffic as well. I get it. Sure. Yeah. I think that the, the stereotype oftentimes you hear about, especially Pinterest, um, social in general, but especially Pinterest is that it's a great way to get a lot of traffic in the beginning and fast. Um, so do you guys agree with that? Was it something that you, I mean, I know Jen, it was somewhat your experience, but you were in at the very beginning of Pinterest. And I want, I would like to hear how your Pinterest strategy has adjusted 
now that you're several years in, you got that, you can get that first blush of traffic from Pinterest. And then how do you continue to sustain growth and uh, stay active within the platform? Uh, and we'll start with Jen. Well, I mean, it, you know, back in the day, I would literally pin something and I would immediately go look at my Google Analytics and it would go up. It was like the best ever, you know, I could only wish for those days again. Yeah. It was like a game. Um, but, you know, obviously that that game has changed. And I wouldn't say for Pinterest that it's it's an immediate you know, push of traffic, because for me, it's not. Um, it's usually, again, it's more of the long game. And it's getting into those search results, um, so it's 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 a lot of trial and error there to see what what description is going to get you there and what image is going to get you there. Um, what was the other part of the question? <laughs> how how so so basically it was I was asking about the strategy for you going forward. It's just you said it's a lot of trial and error now. It's it's a lot of trial and error, and it's getting it out in a lot of different places. You know, I still do a lot of share groups. You know, to try to get my images out there, and especially when I see one going, then I want to get as many people to pin it as possible. So for me, the share groups are are really important with that for Pinterest, um, along with tribes. You know, and interval pinning and loops. Um, I'm a huge like I, I I use Tailwind. You know, I'm in it every day, and I'm constantly evaluating what's going on. I'm constantly looking and scrolling through my feed. I'm constantly going in and looking at my analytics within Tailwind to see what's working, what's not. Um, you know, stopping doing what's not and doing more of what is, um, especially with loops. Like, you know, there's a lot of talk about loops. Are they effective? Are they not effective? If you're using loops like a fix it and forget it, then no, it's not effective. Um, you know, it's not a crockpot. It's, you know, it's something that has to have a lot of love and a lot of um, attention and you need to spend a lot of time at making sure that the stuff that you're putting on there is quality and then cleaning out your loops and, you know, revisiting them on a really regular basis if, if you want them to work. So I good. put a lot of time with those. I mean, it's good to, uh, yeah, that they're still, but you still see value and you're still seeing a return on your time investment there with a hundred percent. I do because if you can get some clean loops out there um, that are, you know, turning quality content on a regular basis, um, you know, you know, your, your good stuff is getting out there. It's when you're, it's when you're just putting the stuff in there and not spending any time to give it attention and to make sure that it's, it's that you've got good stuff going on and that it's stuff that people are responding to. So that's where I see people who aren't having luck with that. Tanya, same question to you. Talk to me about your Pinterest strategy. Um, well, mine was, I guess my experience was a little bit different because when I started my blog, I think Pinterest had changed. And so when I would post, I was pinning like crazy and um, my traffic wasn't like increasing like crazy. But when I took the break, I did notice that um, a couple of my pins that I had put out in the universe months later, they started to bring in traffic. And I was like, oh, this really is a long game, like everyone says. Mm -hmm. um, so when I came back, my strategy was to, you know, continue like I had been doing doing my Pinterest research when I created a, a co whatever content I created, I would look to see what pins were out there. I would look to see what keywords I needed to keyword my pins. I probably only created two pins per post. Um, and then I would just, you know, um, I use Tailwind, so I would make sure my Tailwind queue was full. And I was also using Smart Loops. I did see good return on Smart Loops and um, I do the minimum of tribes. I don't do shared threads only because I just don't have, I well, initially I had a really slow computer and it was taking me way too long. So I just stopped and the growth of my traffic, I just chose to not to focus on shared threads to just focus on um, creating more content and really trying to optimize my site for Google. Um, so that's pretty much how my strategy is. I've now hired a VA to take over my Pinterest because I just got, I would always forget to keep my queue full. So that's my advice for anyone too, is if you have a strategy, great, but if you are a person like me and you just hate, hate, hate remembering to keep your queue full, it's not a bad idea to hire help for, you know, to help out with Pinterest. That's, I know how to operate Pinterest great, but at the same time, I just, I don't necessarily like making sure that my queue is full. So I just- If it's not, if it's not your it. love and it's not your thing, I mean, even if you know how to do it, if you're not, if it's, if you can outsource it and it's, where did you, can I ask where you found your VA? Um, yeah, I, I think someone in the media buying group recommended her, but it's Nicole Barker, virtual VA. She does my Pinterest and she's been doing an amazing job. 
Fantastic. Good to hear. Okay. Switching to another social platform that we all love that can be a great traffic generator. Let's talk a little bit of Instagram because nobody's mentioned it. Oh, I just saw two really awkward faces. <laughs> that like everyone wanted to do the Homer Simpson fade into the bushes move. Um, so <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm getting a sense from both of you that perhaps Instagram is not your most uh, popular platform. Is that accurate? So, I mean, I personally love like Instagram as a user. Um, I brands love Instagram. So I will always like I put a I put time into Instagram. Um, I don't have a huge ROI for it for as far as traffic. Okay. But um, for sponsored work, it's 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 super important. They they want it, they love it, they need it, so I will do it. Tanya, same question. Instagram for you. Yeah, so I think it really depends on your business strategy. Um, I don't work with a ton of sponsors because I just, that wasn't what I really wanted to focus on. My business strategy, I love ad income and I love affiliate income. So that's okay. where I've focused mostly on. So Instagram is not a big traffic bringer for me. I still show up there because I do love the community on Instagram. So I do like posting there, but I do agree like brands love Instagram and they're always wanting to know that you have an engage, even if it's not a huge account, they want to know that you got engagement and that you're there all the time. And I will disappear from Instagram for weeks at a time. Um, not on purpose, but it's just, since it's not the main function of my business, I don't show up as much as I should, but when I do show up, I actually do get really good engagement. So I do like that platform. Um, and I do intend to hopefully start focusing more on that in, in the future. So do both of you have the swipe up? Just asking for, you both have the trap. No, you don't, Tanya. Okay, so are, is that a goal for you to achieve the swipe up? Because I have a question asking how, if you have any great strategies, and if you don't, it's okay. But if you have any good strategies for getting to the swipe up level. Um, it's not necessarily, it's a goal, of course, because I would love an additional um, method to get more traffic, but I've noticed that um, I can still get traffic without having it, not tons and tons of traffic. I get traffic food blogger, I do post a lot of images of my food, and I've also been putting my whole recipe a lot in the actual caption for Instagram, because that gets the most engagement. And the way that I do get traffic is I may do like two of those posts where the whole recipe is in there. And then I do my, the, the third post will probably just be a link or direction saying, hey, to get the recipe, click on the link in my bio and then click the image. And if I've got a post that has really good engagement, I'll actually get a lot of traffic on that day. Excellent. Jen, same question to you. You do have the swipe up, yes? Yeah, I mean, it's just being present there and it's, it's being active. I mean, I think that's how you get the followers there. Um, I, well, I don't have a VA for Pinterest because I keep that pretty close to me. Um, I do have someone who works with me on Instagram. Um, and, um, it was it's actually a high, it's a high school student and I've used, used a high school student every year and they're great because they're on it and they get it and, you know, they're, they're constantly on their phones. So that's been really good. And, um, you know, but, um, yeah, I, 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 the, the biggest thing about Instagram is that if you don't babysit it, it you're, everything goes away. Like if you are not on it, like I was not on it when in between, in between high school students, I was not on it for a couple of weeks and it killed my engagement. Mm -hmm. um, so now I'm like climbing back uphill. Okay, good, good feedback. So shifting, uh, do you, before we move on from social or social platforms in terms of traffic growth, do you have any other tips or platforms you want to mention or anything social before we move back to organic? Either I've, one of you? I've got one. It's not necessarily social, but um, email. Like I started focusing more on growing my email list. Um, I still like use my email to tell my audience about affiliates, but growing your email list and having an engaged list, you will see an influx of traffic if you're sending out the right kind of emails and enticing them to click. Um, and what I've noticed is that when people, people will email me back, but they will also share, like they'll make the recipes and they'll also go and share it on social. So I would not forget email list. That's the platform, what's well, the platform, but you pretty much control it. And if you are always shown, I show up twice a week in people's inboxes. So they will always remember you if you're, you know, showing up and making sure you're sending out your emails. I want to piggyback on that because I'm so glad you brought that up, Tanya, because I ignored my email for 
years, like up until about a month and two ago, I was just doing an RSS feed from Mad Mimi. And I recently started working with um, Matt Mullen and we're, we're doing, I'm like, you know, I'm in like the kindergarten class for email right now with him. <laughs> and that's actually my four o'clock call today that I have with him. So he oh. literally is like holding my hand through, you know, being a big girl emailer. And um, in the four weeks that I've been working with him, I'm seeing like really, really great things. Um, I'm super excited about it and I'm excited about it because it's the one thing you own. I mean, once you have those names, they're yours. Yep. And, um, you know, unless I unsubscribe to you, that's a very captive audience who, who want to be there. They're not just like pressing like on something. They're having to actively put their email address in and saying, yes, I want this. So now I'm working on um, multiple welcome sequences um, forever sequences and, um, you know, understanding it, but it took me, I like, I, I had to pull up my big girl pants and say, you got to do something about this because what you're sending them, is not good. And that's not fair. Uh, you can't say enough good things about Matt Mullen. He spoke at our conference in Chicago. He's been on live with me before we have those episodes. We'll be sharing those. He's, he's awesome. And he knows his stuff for sure. I can also say that, um, he will excuse you for being a few minutes late because he's a good guy. Cool. Uh, so so um, email for sure. We can't encourage enough to to have you guys grow the email list because an algorithm is never going to hit you. Nobody's arbitrary changes or not arbitrary, but you are in control. It's what you can sell to brands. It's what converts oftentimes with affiliates. So it is something. So talk a little bit. We've got a couple questions and we're going to jump in there. But talk to me a little bit about how you incentivize your email. How do you get people into that funnel? Uh, Tanya, we'll start with you. Um, so beforehand, I wasn't sending out any emails, not um, RSS feed or anything. And then I did watch the live with Matt Mullen. Oh, yeah. And what I took from that was the welcome sequence. And so I actually didn't even create a lot. I created one <laughs> welcome sequence on my most popular post. And I just have it. It's not even a pop up or anything. It's just right below my hero image. Um, and I did that on purpose because I want the people that sign up for my email to really want to get there. And I did a startup guide. So it's like a guide that people get, they'll get an email um, one day um, for five days and then they get funneled into my, it's really my air fryer email sequence. They get funneled into my air fryer list. Um, and so once a week they get a dedicated air fryer email. And I tell you, those are my biggest fans. Those are the people that are telling everyone about my email list, everyone about my recipes, and it's grown like wildfire and people in my neighborhood apparently know about this email list. So <laughs> it's like my husband got stopped at the store and they're like, oh yeah, I know your wife. She's got those air fryer emails and whatever. So that is um, so awesome. It, it, was, it, was, it was actually really cool. So um, before I really wasn't, um, you know, paying any attention to it, but once I watched that live, I realized how valuable email is and the reason why it's so important is you've grown these dedicated fans. So when you want to sell them an affiliate that you think will help them or even a product, those are the people that are wanting to buy from you. I have people even asking, like, when are you going to drop, you know, a cookbook or whatever? So um, it's been pretty much a game changer, not just for traffic wise. It helps. I get a lot of clicks through when I do send out like a recipe or whatever post. But I also think it's great for just growing an audience and showing your audience you're an expert in whatever you're talking about. They're your people, man. Those are the people that are going to buy. They're, they want to hear from you, and you got to give them what, what they want. It's so good to hear. So how long have you been focusing on emails? Just since that live, Tanya? Yeah, whenever that live happened, that's when I actually started. Um, and I saw my signups skyrocket. I was getting initially like maybe five signups a day and now I get about 40 to 50 signups a day just that by is awesome. implementing that strategy. I probably need to take his course <laughs> in his coaching because just that little bit of information, like I would say anyone, if you haven't watched that live, watch that live if you have or are having trouble with email because it was a game changer for me. And hearing that email is a huge source of traffic is super exciting too. And people in your neighborhood are randomly talking about it. So that's <laughs> Jen, same question to you. Yeah. Yeah. So like I said, Matt, Matt has been a game changer for me. Tell him I sent you. Um, and it's Matt. Someone was at Marissa was asking what's his name? Matt Mullen. Yep, his name. We'll share it. Yeah. We shared and, the live and we'll share his link too. Yeah. He's, he's, he's really, he's been great. So I have, I do have a pop up and I didn't before, but we, the one he had suggested one and I have a tech guy who was a little worried about it bogging my site down. So um, he suggested bloom for the pop up. Um, and that's what I've been using. So um, 
And my signups like also skyrocketed like Tanya's. Like I was getting like within a month, like for a month I was probably getting, I don't know, 500 or, you know, maybe more than that. But now I'm getting about 1500 a week. Um, awesome. since, like since having the pop up and he's put, he's helped me put like them in some key places on my, you know, on my posts and stuff like that. He's been, um, he's been great. And like I said, he's been really holding my hand through it. So I knew for me, like I buy courses, like I'm a course hog and then I don't do them. So I knew if I bought, I bought the course, I would, if I got stuck somewhere, I would just stop. Um, which is why it was, it was worth it for me to spend the extra money to get the coaching because I know it's that important to do. And he really has kind of walked me through not only the how to do it, but the why to do it. And for me, if I don't understand the why, then I'm not gonna, it's just, it's, it, I'm not gonna, it's not gonna be successful. So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind Very of where I'm at. But I do, like I said, I do the welcome sequence. I have a, like a, a easy dessert welcome sequence. I'm starting an easy appetizer welcome sequence and I'll start a couple other ones as well. And then they get funneled into my um, forever series. And then I also do a broadcast email once a week. Fantastic. So many, I love, I love hearing that, that, that those are engaging and that uh, some of that came from the live, which is super exciting to hear. Um, Eden Westbrook asked, what do you put in the emails to get more engagement besides recipes? Uh, Tanya. Um, I usually will just do like a paragraph intro. So whatever, if, if it's like a recipe that has a story behind it, I may put that in there just to get people excited about the recipe as well, just like you would do on a typical blog post. And then I'm usually a one link person for most recipes, unless it's like just recently I did a back to school, you know, cause my daughter started middle school on Monday. So I just sent out an email with a lot of different links that way. Um, and then some of my emails will have um, related affiliates in the email as well. So it's really just, I don't, I kind of just make sure I have a directed email, like, hello, whatever your name is. And it's like, I'm talking to a friend and my particular purpose would be like, this is why you should make this this week. And you'll be surprised how many people will click and literally make it that week. If you are talking to them, like it's your, it, as I talk to it, like it's my, they're my friends. That's great. And Jen, same question to you. Um, well, I mean, it, it's, I, I, it's a formula that Matt uses, so I don't really want to necessarily like sure. throw it to out to the that, group. Like, yeah, don't but it, it's, don't share the secrets to the sauce. Yeah, you sauce. know that it's you know it's kind of one of the benefits of working with him. Um, but you know it's it's obviously linking to particular recipes, but he's kind of have a, has a structure that he's found successful. So you know, go check out his his live. I'm sure he talks about it. There, it. But, yeah. Yeah, Michelle Michelle asked a question about um, Bloom and why like and what makes it better than others. According to my tech person, it just was a lighter, light, lighter weight. It didn't hit bog down the site as much. Um, he was, you know, and and I, I, he tells me what to do, and I do it. So um, I trust, I, I trust him. He's my spirit animal. Fantastic. Good to hear. Good tech people are worth their weight in gold. So we're mm -hmm. starting to run a little bit low on time. I, I want to get both of you to give me your favorite resources for traffic building tips. Are there podcasts? Are there websites? Anything that we can toss to our audience uh, just to share or just favorite blogging resources in general? We always like to ask that question. Uh, Tanya, you first, please. Uh, podcast. I love podcasts. I'm a podcast junkie. Um, but my favorite for SEO building, of course, is theory of content. Oh. It's Great. Um, and I just listened to those. I listened to it on the way to work when I was trying to build and learn everything on my commutes to work. My poor daughter, she had to listen to Amber and Josh talk about SEO, um, but it helps a lot. Um, and just the Mediavine blog post help as well. Um, if you are a Mediavine member and you're in the Mediavine publisher group, I, anytime I have a question, I usually just go to that group and do like the search for whatever I want. Um, just to see if there anyone's have asked and answered that as well. But those are um, generally, I'm trying to think of the other podcasts I like. Um, Chopped is one that I listen to as well. Um, and there's probably other, any blogging related podcasts that I, if I like the topic, I'll usually give it a listen while I'm commuting. Fantastic. Jen, anything to you? Any questions to you? Um, I mean, I've been working um, and listening to Ty Kilgore from um, Everything Digital Marketing. Um, and I'm going to be an attending a, a retreat for him with him. And he's just really, it's, it's a very, it's almost similar to what I'm doing with Matt for, um, SEO. 
Cool. So um, I'm imp- I, I really like what he's been saying. He's been doing lives all summer, so I've been watching those. Um, but I'm not a big podcast person or anything like that. Um, but, you know, and not, and this is 100% not to toot our own horn, but our, the Bloggers Tell All group is where I get the majority of my information because not only do the ladies that I work with have, um, you know, amazing insight and ideas, but the, peop- the, the members there, um, that's where I get a lot of, a lot of great content and, 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 you know, what's going on at the very minute, this very minute. Fantastic advice. Okay, we're sharing links, um, but we are reaching the end of our time, which stinks. And um, I, you guys have been sharing so many great things. But the last question I'm going to ask you both, aside from sharing where we can find you and any um, special offers or exciting things we can share with our audience, um, is if people, if someone out there is struggling to reach the media vine traffic threshold, what can you advise them to do today that might help them get there? Um, so that's going to be the final question. I'm going to give you guys a second to think about it and talk, give a couple of announcements, and then we'll come back and say goodbye to the rest of you uh, to the two um, to answer those final questions. But before I get that final question, as we always do every time we're on live. I'm going to say our farewell and that I'm also saying farewell to the summer of live 2019. It has been swell. It has been great. We are so incredibly grateful to all of our guests. I'm going to kind of do a quick overview. Thank everybody um, in person and in particular because we are so grateful to them. Uh, Week one, we did our three year celebration for Mediavine's move to full service ad management with two of our original publishers. They were Brandy O'Neill with Nutmeg Nanny and Jocelyn Brubaker from Inside Brew Crew Life. Week two, we had two co-founders. We had Amber and Eric on, and they were both uh, sharing all of our secrets and talking uh, past, present, and future. Week three was Trellis with our engineering manager, Jordan Colley. Week four, we talked about Create. We had our vice president of publisher support, Nicole Johnson, on, and our uh, Mediavine publisher, Tara Jacobson, of the site Marketing Artfully. We talked philanthropy and turning passion into compassion. Week five uh, with Julie Tran Daly of the Little Kitchen and uh, also her philanthropy, which is um, blogging for kids or cookies for kids cancer. And then we have a site, a, a link for her to get involved with her amazing fundraiser that she does yearly. And Media Vine is also a contributor. And then Betsy Eves of Java Cupcake and Operation Gratitude. Week six was books and publishing with Media Vine publishers Jen Ruiz of Jet on a Jet Plane and Valerie Stimmick of Space Tourism Guide and Valerie and Belise. Product sales was our next week with our experts Chloe McIntosh from Boxwood Avenue and Aaron Chase of $5 Dinners was followed in week seven by Course Creation with Jessica Festa of Jesse on a Journey and Hilary Erickson from Pulling Curls. Decade of Video, as always, in week eight with on-camera aces Meredith Marsh of VidPro Mom and Kristen McDonald of Studio Knit. We crushed affiliate marketing in week nine with Mediavine publisher Amanda Williams of A Dangerous Business and Janine Crooks from AWIN. We covered all things SEO and Beanie Babies in week 10 with Josh Unseth from Theory of Content and Morgan McBride from Charleston Crafted. And last week, we talked about uh, more acronyms. As always, we can't ever get enough with our top RPM maximization tips from with Lance Cothern of his blog, Money Manifesto, and Dorothy Kern from Crazy for Crest. And finally, we had amazing guests this week, Jennifer Fishkin from Princess Pinky Girl and Tanya from My Forking Life. Ladies, will you please share your final thoughts before we say goodbye to the summer of live 2019? We'll start with Jen. Sure, um, so as far as you know, getting to that media vine threshold, I'd say, um, Focus on your SEO 100%, but your social traffic, Pinterest can help you. So, you know, really, I would, I for me, I would say, you know, spend some time on your Pinterest and, um, you know, try a lot of different pins out there and, and, and you know, maximize, you know, that those, those pins because you can, you, it can help you get there, that's for sure. Um, as far as, did you want where to find us or no? We Where's did. We've, shared, we've gone ahead and shared the Bloggers Tell All, but tell us a little bit more about Bloggers Tell All if you want that special. So offer. really quick, it's, yes, it's eight bloggers who are actually blogging and we are there giving, it's a, a more of an advanced group. Um, and we have a lot of people and a lot of questions that come up about getting to that threshold. So that does come up a lot. And we've had a lot of wins of people who've you know made it to Mediavine. Um, based on some of the stuff they've learned there. But we do have a right now um, an offer that we are putting out there. It's a dollar trial for a week. So you can see if it's something that you like. And if it is, you can decide if you want to join. And the link should be in there. And it should take you right to the dollar offer. But um, you've got, you know, 
eight, I think, really, you know, talented bloggers who are from, you know, have all very different experiences and different strengths who can really are in there and active and answering questions. We do weekly lives and we do weekly audits as well. So I hope, you know, if anyone has any questions, feel free to message me about it or just check out the link. Fantastic. Tanya, same question to you. If someone is struggling to reach that 25,000 sessions, what can you tell them? Um, I'm going to echo SEO, um, of course. And what I would say to, um, to piggyback off of that, I, what I focused on was just basically three. I picked the number three and those three traffic bringing th tools. And that's, that's what I focused on when I was trying to reach 25,000, which is why my Instagram game is pretty weak. So when I was, when my goal was, I really want to join Mediavine, I made sure that I was optimizing my post for SEO. I was doing keyword research to make sure that I could actually rank for recipes. So I wasn't targeting those high turn keywords. I was sticking around 2000 or less. And it was easier for me to rank for the lower um, keywords than it would be for higher keywords. And so I did that to build my authority and a lot of related content so that I could interlink like crazy. Um, I think that helps as far as what I was sharing to Pinterest, what I was sharing to Facebook, creating similar content that was well re keyword research, that will help you grow your site um, faster if you're trying to reach the media bond threshold to get that 25,000, um, um, I guess, sessions per month. Correct. In the previous 30 days. It doesn't have to be from the beginning of the month to the end of the month, just the previous 30 days via your Google Analytics. Thank you so much. And where can we reach you, Tanya? Oh, I'm My Forking Life. That's M-Y-F-O-R-K-I-N-G-L-I-F-E.com. I have to spell it out because I know sometimes people hear something differently. <laughs> um, like, what you say? <laughs> um, and I'm on Pinterest. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. Um, don't find me on Twitter because I barely twi tweet anything, <laughs> but I'm on there too. Um, so yeah, that's where I can be found. And I'm well, at princesspinkygirl.com. I forgot to mention We've got all of that shared in the comments. If you have any questions on that and want to get in touch with uh, our amazing guests, I am so grateful to you guys for being here. Thank you for sharing all of that uh, great information. And we appreciate it. It's such a great, exciting time to see bloggers lifting each other up. It's, it's what we're here for. We're all about education. And I want to also thank an incredible audience. You guys are with it. You've been with us every week this summer. And if you're looking for these episodes, they are always available on our Facebook. And once we have the edited versions, they will go up on the Mediavine YouTube channel. So subscribe to that and make sure that you're not missing an episode. We are kicking off season two of Teal Talk in a couple of weeks. It's going to be Thursday, September 12th at 2 p.m. with our CEO, Eric Kochberger. We're going to do an overview of all of his RPM increasing strategies to get you guys ready to kick all the butts in Q4. If you have any suggestions for content or guests for an upcoming episode, please email in. We're here for you at sponsored at mediavine.com. And I just want to say thank you for an incredible summer. Everyone have a great Labor Day weekend and we will see you in the fall. Thank Thanks, you guys Jenny. so much. Thanks for coming. Bye, Bye everyone.